Alrighty, so I get to follow Rory, so that's going to be fun. Um, how's everybody doing? Um, today I'm here to talk about serverless microservices, and um, this is just a preface right up front. This is going to be kind of heavily cloud-based because that is kind of where the serverless environment sits. Um, so, yeah, um, in case anybody doesn't recognize me without the glasses, that's me. Uh, my name is Gareth McComsky. I uh, am a uh, solutions architect at a company called Serverless Inc. Uh, we build the Serverless Framework, which is an open source tool to help you run and, and manage and configure and deploy serverless applications uh, in the cloud. Uh, in the past, I've been building sites since the early 2000s, uh, but basically started professionally being a developer since about 2008. And I've been building serverless applications uh, for uh, employers and customers since about 2016. And about three months ago, uh, the serverless, uh, serverless Inc., the, the company, approached me and said, you've been involved in the community for a long time, uh, we'd like you to do that full time, so please join us. And that's when I joined them. So here I am speaking about uh, the project. So I want to go back a bit because to set the context for what serverless is and what it means, there's sometimes a lot of confusion. Uh, people ask a lot of questions. It's a difficult concept to get across sometimes. Uh, but I find it's a lot easier when you look back at how we used to and how we currently do things when it comes to web development as a, as a single use case. Uh, and that kind of really explains how serverless can help solve problems in a, in a better way. So for me, thinking back in time, 2012 was about, I think, the last time that I actually used physical hardware, where I was, in, where I was working with an organization that had its own data center, had its own hardware that it needed to manage and maintain. Uh, not so long ago, but uh, yeah. So in this case, the company had nine individual uh, Blade servers uh, for just running HTTP. It was a, a company that had a website as a product. And development back then when you had physical hardware was a hell of a lot more focused on performance uh, because hardware wasn't so easy to get. Uh, if you needed to replace hardware, this was a very time-consuming process of placing orders and getting uh, quotes and wheeling and dealing to get a best, the best price and then waiting for it to be shipped because most of the time these things didn't live in this country. They had to be shipped from Europe or the US. So, uh, and the other downside of these uh, situations is that you don't often have the option for a regional fallback. So you have a single data center with all your hardware in it and that might have dual power supplies to the building, dual internet connections to the building. But in my case, uh, with the company I was working for, they had a dual internet connection running next to each other in the pavement. So when somebody came to, lay, to fix some things in the pavement, they just chopped both through both lines. <laughs> so redundancy didn't work there. But um, looking back at sort of the architecture of what an application back then looks like, it looks actually very familiar, very similar to what we have today, even with the cloud being so pervasive. And in general, you'll see uh, architectures with a load balancer up front. So you have a, one of these single blade servers sitting up front receiving all the HTTP requests. There's probably two here. I wasn't involved in the actual machine side of things. I was one of the developers in the team. Um, but back then, this setup alone was one of the hard problems to solve. Uh, this wasn't easy to do simply because uh, network was also a really difficult issue even in a local data center. So load balancing ended up being a tricky thing, and you can imagine there, there's only two web servers connected in this diagram, but back then there were six. So, you know, you had a bit of stuff to fiddle with there. And then the usual uh, uh, back end with your database with a master and a, a read replica. Kind of familiar, and we kind of take this sort of uh, architecture for granted these days. This is pretty ordinary stuff. Back then, these were individual machines that had to run all of the software. So what was hard about this kind of setup? What were the problems involved? I've already mentioned some, but again, upgrades. If you had to upgrade some of your hardware, if you suddenly your traffic started uh, climbing, uh, your upgrades were weeks away, which caused a lot of problems. You also had to have people in-house that knew how to deal with this hardware, because it's not just a VM that you can install software on. Sometimes hardware has specific things to have to deal with. Uh, and the cost with over-provisioning. So because hardware was so hard to get, you got more hardware than you needed, so you had this data center with mo much more hardware than your actual traffic uh, required, just to be sure that six months from now when the sales team really gets going, you're not holding them back by not having enough uh, hardware in place. And like I'm alluding to, this makes growth really hard, because if you do suddenly start having this massive growth that you weren't expecting, uh, you just upgraded a month ago, but suddenly you're already hitting the limits of your hardware. Well, now you've got a problem. You've got to go through this cycle of upgrading again. 
which ends up meaning that developers, instead of spending time building features for your product, they have to spend time optimizing the application because you're still waiting for that delivery of new hardware, but you need to still get more cycles out of the CPUs in these machines. And ended up with lots of sort of headless chicken time. What, what happened here? Why did it fall over? Was this the code? Was this network? Was this the data center? Lots of issues that you have to deal with that you sometimes uh, struggle to figure out. So things started to change, obviously, in uh, 2008 when AWS uh, essentially made, uh, AWS became generally available, and the pioneer product essentially was EC2, where we can now, instead of having all this hardware, we can now spin up virtual machines to replace all of this hardware that we used to have to deal with all the time and try to focus on stuff in the cloud. It doesn't solve all the problems, but it helps in a lot of situations. And that's where we can take this, ar this architecture that I showed before in a previous slide, and we can now apply it into a cloud context instead. And this ends up being uh, pretty much a sort of lift and shi shift operation. Fundamentally, the ideas are the same. You have virtual machines, which, are, which fulfill the place of an actual physical piece of hardware, and you can essentially take your entire application, move it into the cloud as is. I know there are differences, so that you do have to know some of the differences, but essentially the architecture ends up staying the same, roughly. So for example here, with that example I gave before, we have the, we can create six EC2 instances to replicate the same kind of thing that we had in the data center. Uh, install, installation of software is roughly the same. Uh, there's very few changes here. You can install an OS, you can install your web server, your database. Uh, and now you in the, in the fortunate situation of having multiple instances in case any happen to fall over. Instead of having a limited set of hardware, you can even replace uh, um, other uh, instances with new instances if problems occur. And you also have uh, a database, uh, the usual database master with a read replica that you can fall over to. And if server load is too high, well, you can go ahead and replace those instances you used to have with a certain CPU memory and just upgrade them to bigger and better things. A lot easier to do. And this became sort of the new reality that, that uh, as, as, as developers and, and, and people managing uh, infrastructure, we started to deal with with uh, building our infrastructure in the cloud. And along, uh, during that time frame, AWS wasn't standing still. It wasn't a case of, here's EC2. Uh, they continue to advance and, and, and introduce additional services that you can use instead of having to essentially create your own. So Amazon S3 is one of the big ones that they have. Um, I'm gonna go into more detail about some of these services later. But Amazon S3 is a big data store. You can drop a bunch of files in there, so you've got a great place to store uh, files. SES, if you need to share file systems across instances. SNS, for sharing pub sub type notifications. SQS, for me uh, message queues between uh, instances and applications. And a whole bunch of other services. And this isn't even a complete list. This is just a picture I got online, which I think is a couple of years old. AWS is probably, I think, 50% more should be on that list. But it just gives you kind of the scope. A you know, the, the cloud vendors in general, not just AWS, are trying to help us with services to uh, do things that we used to have to do ourselves. So, going through all of these changes in infrastructure, uh, development as well changes along with it. So over time, uh, developers start making use of all this additional infrastructure we can. So when you start with a monolithic web stack, uh, the traditional uh, 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 basic code blob that receives requests, handles an MVC style infrastructure and returns an HTML response, uh, that's kind of where uh, web application in general has been. And with the sort of VM revolution around 2008, we started seeing uh, something called a services-oriented architecture gaining a bit of popularity uh, and then kind of falling short of that. Uh, and this is one of those uh, patterns that I think was something that was a little bit ahead of its time because this is a pattern where you're trying to make the best use of virtual machines, networking infrastructure in the cloud, which just wasn't quite there to support the kind of stuff that people were trying to do uh, in this pattern. Uh, but this was a precursor to essentially what we're going to talk about today, which is microservices. So this was kind of, you know, the ahead, of, ahead, of, ahead of its time precursor to microservices. But all of this is essentially following the environment that developers are being given and being exposed to, trying to make the maximum use of all this infrastructure. And I like this picture just because this kind of breaks down that idea of what the monolithic services oriented and then ultimately microservices looks like. And really, all it is is going from a very coarse-grained, monolithic, single blob of application, which control, controls essentially your presentation, data, and, and uh, business logic layers, breaking them down into separate layers individually, separate services, but then breaking it down even further as microservices into much smaller chunks. 
So that's the evolution that we've been seeing over time. So let's take a look at the sort of, we've looked at sort of the VM side of things, but let's, let's, let's try and understand what that looks like now with this new evolution of containers that we find ourselves in. So if you're looking at your monolithic application and you want to do what we did previously, we were just lifted and shifted into the VM world, doing this into containers is a bit of a different story. Uh, it's not quite as easy to do, it's not quite as elegant. Uh, you could design and configure your specific application to be in a container, to be uh, deployable uh, in that environment, to be uh, provisioned in that way. Uh, but all you're essentially doing is wrapping, uh, wrapping your application in a bit more complexity, and it's still ultimately running on a virtual machine in the end anyway. And what about your data sources as well? You've got a relational database more than likely, this big massive uh, source of data, and that is probably still going to sit in a, in a virtual machine, no matter how many containers you throw at your application. And orchestration then becomes an issue as well because now you need some way to manage these containers, to provision them, to uh, l uh, scale them, and so on. Um, so you need, um, as it says, Mesos was king for a little while back then, uh, but Kubernetes is now the, the big daddy in the, in the environment. And all of this doesn't necessarily mean that you're suddenly doing microservices. This is just taking your monolithic blob and sticking it in a container. Um, and I've had people say to me, oh, we totally went microservices, our, our monolith is sitting in a container now. Um, not quite the idea of microservices. You're not really getting any of the benefits of microservices in this way. So instead, let's figure out what microservices really are. What it means to have microservices. So the definition of microservices is one of these, it's, it's a slightly contentious thing. It's a very difficult thing to pin down. There's many different definitions of what microservices really are. But there are some common patterns that you can see if you speak to people uh, about what microservices are. Microservices are. One of the big ones is that your apps, you're essentially breaking down this enormous application into lots of mini micro applications that are uh, uh, bound by domain. And what domain means uh, might vary depending on your environment. If you're in the uh, uh, DDD crowd, you might have a very fixed def defined structure of how to break that out. Uh, but you'll find many organizations will break their different domains uh, out into different, uh, into different types. But what it does also mean is that these domains, these specific services you build, uh, ultimately are aimed to do one thing and do it really, really well. Kind of the old Unix uh, philosophy of apps that do one thing and do it really well. They also uh, tend to be or, or try to be as decoupled as possible from each other. Decoupling is one of those hard problems we've had in, in development for a very long time. Uh, but funnily enough, when you're building microservices, decoupling your services ends up, uh, at least decoupling code via microservices, kind of ends up being an easier problem to solve than if you're trying to decouple modules in a single code blob because you have these architectural barriers that, you, that are already in place to try and make that distinction between your microservices a bit easier. And the other idea is that services themselves maintain their own data sources. So instead of having the single uh, relational database that you, all your services will talk to, um, if you have that, you're you, you haven't decoupled uh, quite fully. <coughs> Because the problem with that is if you have multiple services and one of them decides to change the schema in your relational database that all the other services depend on, none of those services know about the schema change and things will end up falling over. So the idea is to keep your data sources separate in your services so that each worries about how it's managing its own data. It can change the schema any way that it likes, but you have, you have interfaces between your services and that's really what you need to maintain. So you expose interfaces between your services when you, when you need to communicate between uh, the different services in your application, instead of worrying about data sources that share data uh, that in that way. Okay, so um, what I want to do is take a look at a sort of, uh, take away from the abstract now, because this is all sort of theoretical pie in the sky type stuff uh, I'm talking about. Let's try and look at something a bit more practical to envision this in our head. So I'm going to take a look at what a sort of monolithic application will look like sitting in the regular VM environment that, that we, we all know. And I've just called this Gareth's order system because naming is hard. And uh, this is a application like you'd see in a Symfony application, an Express application, uh, MVC style, where you have multiple modules all essentially serving specific entities. So they're performing uh, sort of CRUD-like create, read, update, and delete uh, actions on entities that you end up storing in a database somewhere. Very regular web application. This is a very common pattern that you'll end up seeing. <coughs> What you'll see is a monolithic, monolithic application like this will receive HTTP requests from outside. So we have the code base itself is eventually receiving an HTTP request. Uh, 
sure there's probably a load balancer somewhere that's deciding which web server to send traffic to, but ultimately the app is processing this uh, HTTP request. Internally, there's some routing mechanism that's going to receive this, that's going to read the URL and decide which of my uh, controllers to send this uh, request to, to fulfill it. So I make a customer list request, and it ends up going to the right uh, module that's needed. This processes my view layer uh, with data extracted from the database and returns a response in a, uh, an HTTP response. So my browser now has content to display based on this whole interaction. Very common stuff. But um, let's take a look at an app like that and what it means to run that in an AWS recommended sort of minimum architecture for a production workload that is meant to be redundant and sort of scalable and safe to run a production app on. So first of all, we want to start with a load balancer because we need some way to receive uh, HTTP requests and then distribute that to our web servers. And this is where uh, the recommendation is to have at least three uh, virtual machine instances uh, on each availability zone in your AWS region, just so that you've got a way to uh, manage if a specific region falls over completely. Um, with this setup, if a whole region falls, uh, a whole availability zone falls over, and an availability zone is basically a building. So in each region, there's three separate buildings, each one completely dis uh, sort of disconnected from each other so that if one falls over, the other two can keep running. Uh, it, the recommendation is also to have a database cluster of at least two database instances so that you have your master and read replica so that, again, you have a failover situation. And when you start looking at the costs involved with this, uh, if you just look at those three EC2 instances that you're supposed to keep running uh, permanently, uh, at the at the smallest instance size that's available on AWS yesterday, uh, you're paying around $11.23 on a 30-day month. And this is a base infrastructure. This is uh, before anything else is happening in your, uh, in your application. It doesn't include the load balancer. doesn't include the database. And you can have a load balancer that'll end up spinning up additional instances, but this normally takes some time. Uh, you know, this kind of load balancing doesn't happen instantly, so you might, you're probably going to need uh, your base instances to be slightly bigger to manage that influx of traffic so that it gives time for additional instances to load up. What this means as well is that you now have uh, machines that you have to maintain the operating system and applications on. So it's not just spinning this infrastructure up and leaving it alone to do its thing. You need to monitor, maintain, uh, and, and, and handle all of the updates for these uh, machines. And again, this is all, you're starting to do this all without any traffic actually even hitting anything. So you have three EC2 instances, maybe it's these uh, T3 micros, but now you suddenly have traffic, it's spinning up uh, six additional instances to manage traffic, your costs start climbing, your complexity starts climbing as well. So instead, let's see what taking that application looks like if we break it up into microservices now. So we had that monolith with all the load balancer and the EC2 instances, let's break it down into what a microservices version of that application would look like. So first of all, this blob here, Rick, uh, is the back end of my application. So before the monolith kind of handles the front end and back end together as one uh, code base, microservices will end up s uh, tend to split this out uh, in general. And what you'll see is those modules that were in the same code base are now actually separate mini applications that you run uh, in parallel. And they're all essentially little mini applications themselves. So instead of having that one application that runs uh, in a VM, you split this up into three individual pieces. Uh, each has its own uh, data store now, so that you've, you've, you've met that requirement as well, so you're, you're completely decoupled here. You don't have to, uh, having uh, one of these missing doesn't prevent the other one from still uh, being able to do its job. Uh, your front end now, though, is replaced by a static front end with the JavaScript framework of choice. Uh, I've listed a whole bunch here, but there's probably a couple missing. Uh, and this is usually going to be on something like an EC2 instance. instance. You're going to run an Nginx, uh, probably a CDN in front of this, so that it can just serve static content nice and quickly. And then you need some way uh, to manage uh, requests from your front end to each service. So the front end is often going to call the service directly. You might have a layer in between that to manage that. It depends on how you decide to build it. What that means is that, um, that each service now has to manage its own traffic uh, individually. So this starts looking a little bit more complex. And I mentioned how each data source has its own, uh, each service has its own data source, but how do you, for example, handle situations where your uh, order service has, your order service requires a customer and a product in order to define what an order means? Traditionally, you do that with foreign key IDs in your relational database, which is a relatively simple solution to that problem, 
But if you want to keep data sources uh, uh, um, uh, decoupled here, you can't rely on these foreign key IDs. They don't, don't necessarily make sense. You could, of course, uh, require HTTP requests between services. So if I create an order, I pass a customer ID. If I want to resolve the customer ID, I make an HTTP request to my customer service. But this gets really bad really quickly, so it's definitely not something I'd recommend. So the usual way that these types of problems are solved is that you have a synchronization layer uh, in the background so that if, for example, I add a new customer in my customer service layer, that, uh, that uh, change is then uh, announced through an events layer that all my other services that, are, that need customer information can hook into. So my order service can stay in sync with what the uh, customers are because it stores customer information in the service itself. Sounds like a long, complicated process, but the idea here is that you have services that even if the customer service goes down completely, I can still work with orders because the order service is completely decoupled and manages all the data by itself. It doesn't have to have a customer service sitting there in order to produce uh, order lists and order details. So let's look at just one of these services in a bit more detail just to make it a bit clearer. Because I mentioned you've got this front end sending API requests to the services but this means that this microservice now needs its own load balancer. It's probably going to need three individual virtual machines inside those accessibility zones for failover purposes. The uh, containers are going to be running inside those virtual machines themselves, so that's going to be provisioned there. And again, this starts looking more complex. And uh, as I mentioned, you have your database, which is going to maintain its own state of what orders, customers, and products looks like. Because this is the order service. It needs to know about products. It needs to know about customers in order to create order information. And again, we've got that uh, message layer so that if an order is created, that uh, order creation or updating can be announced through the sort of a message bus that can then be communicated to the other services. So you might be thinking, that sucks. <laughs> so it doesn't, it doesn't. Uh, there's actually a lot of advantages to microservices. And even that complexity, uh, which seems like a hell of a lot of stuff to worry about, um, it also affects your cost, obviously, because instead of just a couple of uh, EC2 in instances at a base level to manage an application, each service kind of needs that on its own. But, uh, and the Elastic Container Service uh, that you find in AWS, for example, doesn't necessarily help that a lot. It does a bit, just helps managing, uh, sort of managing that layer a bit better, but it still uses EC2 instances in the background as well. Uh, and as I mentioned, you now have services, each with its own app-like structure. So you need all of that infrastructure to manage all that load and so on. And you need staff that know about containers, that know about Kubernetes, that understand, understand orchestration systems, that can work with containers, which in this day and age is becoming a harder skill to find. But this kind of setup does make scale a lot easier to manage because now instead of a massive blob, Maybe you have your, your a customer uh, API call uh, happens and that completely kills the entire monolith, but that was just the one module in your code base that's affecting traffic on your entire cluster. If you're running in a microservices environment, you end up scaling just the customer service to manage that load, and all the other services continue running as they were. And that's just one example. But that's one of the ways that scaling microservices makes a lot of sense. I'm going to look at some other benefits in a bit. And it does also improve development. So this is a, a microservices has a massive advantage for a dev team. So what the hell are these benefits? Well, deployment becomes easy because of the decoupled nature of your services. And the basic idea here is, as I mentioned, you've got these data sources that are separated. In my monolith, if my customer uh, module wants to change the schema for the customer tables, my other modules need to be uh, adjusted accordingly because this is a massive change. They're going to fall over if they start querying for tables whose structure is completely different to what I'm, uh, I've coded for. But with the decoupled nature, I can have a dev team uh, building for my customer service and making changes to that. But as long as my interfaces that uh, my other services might communicate through remain the same, it doesn't matter. I could, complain, I could change the entire database system underneath, and the rest of the services don't care about that. So for a dev team, this means you can leverage, uh, you could get really fast and, and develop really quickly. Reliability in general will go up. Um, as I mentioned, if you have a, uh, these three services and your customer service goes down entirely, you can still uh, retrieve order data. You don't have to resolve foreign key IDs or anything like that in order to build uh, order data. You've got that data sitting waiting to be used. Uh, as a developer with context switching, this becomes a bit easier because if you're the developer in charge of the uh, customer service, that's all you need to worry about. 
you don't have this big blob of code that you need to now understand the routing mechanisms for and these tweaks that were done with this module and this form and this, cl this class here that affects my module over here that I've never seen before. Uh, you have to only focus on your small chunk of work and it makes, it makes it a bit easier. It also can make testing simpler. Uh, microservices adds complexity in the, uh, uh, the, the structure of your architecture. But again, if you're the developer of the customer service, your testing is relatively simple. You're only testing the interactions of that customer service. And a contentious uh, argument here, uh, but it makes polyglot environments possible as well. Uh, so if you, a lot of organizations don't like the idea of being able to have microservices with lots of different languages because that can in in increase some developer complexity. That one guy who's running that one service written in some arcane language you've never heard about leaves. Now somebody has to take that over. That's definitely a problem. But managed well, having, being, being, having the ability to use multiple languages in your application can be really, really useful, especially when you start mixing environments like machine learning and, and big data and so on. You've been building in PHP or Node, and suddenly you want to do uh, machine learning, which is very strong in Python. Well, you're in microservices. You can now build Python-based microservices instead. And now, because of the sort of ephemeral nature of our containers, where we can essentially drop an entire container and it doesn't matter, uh, you know, if, if an application suddenly starts racking up CPU costs, uh, we can just drop these containers, they can be replaced. Performance isn't quite as much of a focus as we used to have to be in the past. Our hardware can be replaced within seconds, so it's not as big an issue. So your dev team can tend to focus on features a lot more than the performance issues. And what you'll find is, especially in uh, large dev teams, in large organizations building uh, applications, dev time costs a hell of a lot more than the infrastructure on a, on a cloud vendor. And this also uh, helps in the uh, environment of, uh, of small development teams managing their own microservices and the mantra of you build it, you run it. So the dev team is responsible for developing, maintaining, deploying, and monitoring and managing the entire service from start to finish. There isn't necessarily a dedicated team that manages all the infrastructure. You probably have that to some degree, set up your backend infrastructure and so on. But developers can now run and maintain their own services, which just gives a lot more flexibility. Okay, so there are some benefits to microservices. So that's, that's cool. It's complex, it costs a lot, but there are some benefits to it. But should you actually do it? So if you are a large organization pulling millions of page views a minute, I would say absolutely yes, you should seriously be looking and considering this type of architecture. The simple reason is that uh, you don't at this point, you don't necessarily care about the infrastructure costs of microservices. The ability to scale, have developers be uh, as fast as they are, is definitely where you want uh, your wins to be. This is what's costing you more money than the infrastructure costs to run your microservices. However, what if you're not the Ubers, the Netflixes, the uh, Walmarts of the world who've got these millions of page views a minute? What if you only pulled maybe a few, uh, a few million page views a month? And this is where I have a yes but. So, the problem here is we've got all this infrastructure that you need to manage if you want to run microservices. But you, don't want to, you, can, you can do this as a small organization, just not with containers. And this is where serverless now starts coming into the picture. So we finally got there. Uh, the idea now is, and this is not just for small organizations. We've actually seen big companies uh, using serverless as a way to quickly get uh, features and business uh, logic out. The idea here is instead of going ahead and building and constructing your own infrastructure by yourself from scratch, you use the existing uh, vendor-specific managed services that are available to you in the cloud, you know, from this big list that I showed before. There's a lot of stuff there, and a lot of that stuff is really, really useful and can do a lot of things for you that you don't need to do yourself and can alleviate a lot of issues. But not all of it is great for building serverless services. So there's a new idea of what we call serverless managed services. So these are services available from these vendors that have certain properties that lend them really well to be called uh, serverless. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at an EC2 instance, your capacity on an EC2 instance is given to you in uh, CPU, in memory, uh, maybe disk space, but in uh, GPU, even if you're doing an AI type uh, instance. But with a serverless managed service, you don't have to worry about these capacity metrics being given to you and these hard to understand things because what does, how many, how many uh, HTTP requests can you handle on X CPU? It's not quite clear how that works. A serverless managed service will speak to you in the actual measurable metrics that you care about, in uh, gigabytes per second, in uh, number of requests per second, in uh, uh, um, concurrent uh, function uh, calls uh, a second, and so on. 
stuff that you can actually measure. It also has spe very specific limits that are given to you right up front so you can completely understand where any limits might lie in the service that you're going to use. In a lot of cases, you can just get these increased as well. So you speak to, in AWS's case, you'll speak to support, and they'll often just increase a, an existing default limit on a service for you, uh, especially if you've got a compelling use case. They, are, they have paper usage models. So the interesting thing here is you're not paying for idle time. You're paying for stuff that you only actually get used out of that capacity metric that's given to you. There are no software upgrades needed. And this is also quite compelling. You don't have to go into this instance and update the OS and, uh, and software. Uh, AWS is essentially managing all of that. That's you just get for being a managed service. And we want to make this, and this is not uh, accessible as Rory was talking about, we want to be able to access these services relatively easily. We want to be able to use an API call in our code to go talk to these services and make, make it do stuff that we want because we don't want to have to only interact with these services uh, via Terraforms or uh, through the consoles. And what this gives us is that we can now focus on our business value and logic instead of worrying about uh, setting up all this infrastructure all the time. And that means that it makes it a lot easier, especially in, uh, as I mentioned, the smaller organizations, we have developers that aren't uh, uh, big in managing infrastructure. They can now actually manage their own microservices if it's all built around managed services. It makes that a lot easier. So uh, let's go ahead and take that microservices uh, 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 architecture I put up before, but let's tweak it uh, for serverless. Let's apply sort of the serverless services that we have available in AWS to see what this will look like. What can we replace? So to start off with, we've got our three uh, microservices that we have running, but already you'll see a difference. We're not here uh, using EC2 instances and containers. Our code is running in AWS Lambda. And if you're not familiar with Lambda, I'm going to talk about it a bit more in a sec, but the short version is that AWS Lambda lets you push code at AWS and say, hold this code for me, and when X event occurs, like an HTTP request, execute it. And that's, that's the basic idea of what Lambda is. Uh, as a database, instead of using a relational database, which uh, isn't strictly serverless, if you think about it, it has CPU, it has connection issues, you have to maintain multiple instances for failover. A service like DynamoDB, for example, is a completely managed service that has specific capacity metrics, auto-scaling, all these lovely features that make it serverless. Uh, reasonably recently, Aurora Serverless is a feature in AWS as well where you can have the relational database but it be serverless as well. So that's kind of a cool idea as well. And instead of an EC2 instance with a web server and uh, a configured uh, CDN, we instead uh, drop our static files essentially for our front end into something like S3. And for our CDN, we drop CloudFront in front of it as well. And both of those are awesome serverless services that we never need to worry about maintaining anything for them. CloudFront will kind of just keep on going and, and caching things for us, and S3 will store our files for pennies to a gigabyte. And now we want to route requests from our front end to our services. So instead of worrying about having load balancers sitting in front of our services, we use a service called API Gateway, which lets you configure essentially routing like you would have, a, have in a traditional application and have those requests get piped to the correct Lambda functions that you need to actually execute that request. And we want that, that uh, the message bus layer to synchronize between our services. So here, instead of running our own Kafka, we can use Event Bridge, one of the newer services in AWS. There's SNS, which is a PubSub uh, service, or SQS, the message queue service. Yeah. So I'm just going to quickly go through these specific services for those who aren't fam totally familiar with them, so you can kind of understand why they're really good replacements for, for these other uh, pieces that we've been talking about. So. As I mentioned, Lambda is a place where you upload code and you put it up there to be executed by an event. And in our example, that's an HTTP event. An HTTP request comes through to API Gateway, API Gateway sends that to a Lambda function, and it does stuff. Uh, scaling is automatic. In fact, it's, it's kind of strange to talk about scaling with Lambda. It's, there isn't anything to scale, it just does stuff. It tells you I have a thousand concurrent ins uh, instances of your code I can run at a time. Uh, and that's just the default. You can have this increased, uh, just speaking to AWS. I've actually seen AWS accounts with a 50,000 uh, concurrent uh, setting for their Lambda functions. So it can get really, really high. And if you're looking at this 50,000, you go, yeah, but I get like millions of views a day. That doesn't sound like nearly enough. Just bear in mind, this is concurrent. This is actual code running in parallel. Um, I've worked with uh, uh, folks who have uh, something like 3,000 concurrent visitors on their sites at a time. 
and every page view generates a lambda, a lambda get, gets executed with every single page view. And the highest concurrency we had, even with, a thousand, with I think it was two and a half thousand concurrent visitors on the site at the time, was about four lambda functions running in parallel for that entire, you know, I think it was six hours in the morning of the, all people on the site. So you're not necessarily going to have 2,500 uh, lambda functions running simultaneously with that many visitors on your site. Uh, it's concurrent. It's, it, it executes, it stops, it'll then execute again when more requests come in. Hope that makes sense. So the idea with Lambda as well is that you code to a specific runtime, and they support multiple runtimes, uh, as you can see there. Uh, the idea, though, is that they have, they've recently released uh, Lambda Layers, which is a new feature where you can essentially spin up your own runtime. So if you don't like any of the runtimes provided, you can use Lambda Layers to incorporate your own runtime. And there's a project that uh, serverless we worked with, a, a guy who built a project called Breath, which lets you run PHP uh, as a, as on Lambda, just for this framework. You just install, and you can run PHP in Lambda very easily. Lambda also gives you some knobs so that you can tune performance. Uh, so if you decide that you don't need super high performance and you want to reduce cost, you're going to pick a very low performance uh, Lambda function. But if you really need things to be speedy, maybe you've got something that's very CPU bound, you'll turn that dial up a bit. It starts costing you more uh, per execution but sometimes that runtime is what you really need. So you have this knob to help control this performance characteristic of your Lambda function as well, which is pretty handy. And it's very simple. It's a, you start with, a, they measure it in memory, but this affects uh, all the resources linearly. So if you add a 128 meg uh, uh, Lambda function and you dial that up to 256 megabyte Lambda function, your CPU also gets doubled, your network also gets doubled at the same time. So that's the basic idea of how it works. And with Lambda, again, there's no idle running costs. You don't pay for a machine sitting there at 2 a.m. in the morning doing nothing. You're only paying for your, the actual execution time of your functions uh, by the 100 milliseconds. And it, they have an, an enormous free tier available. So this is one of those services that you could play around with. Uh, and I've actually built uh, solutions for customers who never pay anything on the AWS bill because they stay under the free tier for an entire month. So it's a very useful way to play around with this without worrying about that AWS bill that's going to come uh, bite you at the end of the month. And like I mentioned, there's, there's no, idle, no idle running costs, no minimum fees, nothing like that. All right, so I'm going to speed up a bit here. So API Gateway, I mentioned this before. This is a way to create HTTP endpoints. You can make this trigger Lambda functions. Uh, it has a lot of features uh, built in to help you build these API endpoints, like request validation, uh, authorizers, so that you can have Lambda functions that check that the request is valid, that the person has the access they need to that Lambda function to make it execute. Uh, you can do rate limiting and use API keys. It's open API or Swagger compliant, so you can actually pull a, uh, a Swagger built SDK out of API Gateway to use. Uh, there's, again, there's the, the idea of no load, balancing, no, no load balancing to worry about because they provide you by default uh, support for 10,000 requests per second. And again, that can be increased uh, on request, so if you need higher than that. And like I said, this can be trigger Lambda functions, but it can also trigger a lot more than that. So it's a very versatile uh, service to use. And again, it's a pay per request. There's no idle running costs. There's no minimum fees. You pay at uh, the base price is $3.5 per million requests. And it gets cheaper the more requests you have. So pretty cheap to use. And again, a very generous free tier. I think it's a million requests a month or something like that. So you only stop paying after you've actually used a million requests. So again, great to play with. You won't incur that, uh, a bill for that. S3. I've mentioned this briefly, this is a storage service where you can drop files into S3. Uh, originally designed for file storage with practically unlimited storage, but you can convert a bucket in S3 into a static web server. So you can serve HTML, CSS, and JS files, which is a really powerful way to build uh, 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 Jamstack type sites. Uh, there's no load balancing again to worry about. That's all managed for you behind the scenes. Uh, the basic parameters that you've got is you can do about 3,500 puts a second. I believe that is, and 5,500 gets uh, per prefix. So that's basically a folder. So you create a, a bucket, you create folders within that. Every folder has this, this capacity available to you to use. And again, it can be increased. So you stick cl CloudFront in front of this. So again, you're worried about that massive amount of traffic you get. But if you drop CloudFront in front of this to provide that in-memory cache so, or CDN layer that you need, that's going to reduce your traffic a lot. And uh, again, with uh, just like the other services, you end up paying per gigabyte stored and per request. There's no uh, idle cost, no uh, minimum fees, and a free tier again, so that if you play around, you're not going to uh, incur a huge bill. So looking at that model that we had, that architecture that we had, do these services cover all our needs? Well, we needed a way to host our front end, so we do that with S3 and CloudFront. 
we needed a way to route API calls from our front end to our back end, and that's doable with API Gateway. We need a way to execute uh, code because we need something that's actually going to retrieve data out of a data store and uh, format that into JSON to then forward it back to the uh, requesting front end, and we can do that with Lambda. Uh, we want to do asynchronous communications between our services, and that's fulfilled with EventBridge, SNS, and SQS. And it can do a lot more if we have other use cases like streaming data where we need to store IoT type data or, uh, or clickstream event data from our front ends. Uh, uh, services like Kinesis, for example, are really useful for ingesting large quantities of data very rapidly. If you want to do GraphQ, uh, GraphQL instead of REST, AppSync is the service for that, so you can use that instead. And what these all have in common, and I've mentioned these briefly before, is that AWS manages all that redundancy for us across all of these services uh, across the availability zones in the region. So you don't have to worry about setting up those three EC2 instances that you had before, because all of the stuff is already redundant across uh, three avail availability zones for you. And that means that if one zone in a region goes down, your S3, your Lambda, your API Gateway is still going to continue running in the other two availability zones in that region. And if you hit service limits, what's nice about this is that instead of things just falling over, there are very specific uh, returns that come from the uh, AWS API. So if you make requests to a service and you've hit that S3 limit, for example, you're going to get a very, uh, a very um, clean error message back from AWS that you can plan for and that you can read in the docs. So you can uh, have proper error management in your application downstream if you start hitting service limits. And I just want to point out, this is not limited to AWS. There are other v uh, cloud vendors that offer similar type services. So if AWS isn't floating your boat and you like what Azure looks like, go for it. Azure provides a lot of similar services that do a lot of the same things. It's just they're slightly different and you just need to learn those, those small differences. But this looks like a bit, of, a bit of hell to set up. Going through the AWS console and clicking all these individual items to get them configured and pointed at each other sounds like a bit of a nightmare. And this is where I start the sales pitch. So, so to be perfectly honest, uh, the serverless framework, in my opinion, is the best uh, framework to use for building serverless applications. I am biased, though, but I was biased before they, met, they got me to join the team, so I guess it's all fair. There are competitors in the space as well, so in the, in the end, my plan is not to get you to go to the serverless framework. It would be great if you did, but serverless architectures in general are a great way to solve the sort of infrastructure-related microservices problem. I'm going to talk about the serverless framework because that's what I know best, so that's just the reality of it. But feel free to explore the whole ecosystem. There's a lot of choices out there in, in, in ways that you might decide you want to manage how you build serverless applications. Serverless framework is just one of them. So what is the serverless framework? Well, it's an open source project. You can go to github.com slash serverless slash serverless right now. It's available for you to use. There's no fees. There's nothing funny there. It's, a, it's an open source project. There's also an NPM module. So you can do an NPM i-g serverless and install serverless onto your local machine to start development. It's really that easy. Uh, the project itself has over 30,000 uh, GitHub stars, so it's quite a popular project. It's not one of the most popular, but it's not bad. Um, and the serverless framework is there to help you configure your microservices requirements using these managed services that I've been going through now that you find in the cloud vendors. So the idea is that you deploy it all with a single command, so you configure an entire microservice, you hit a command to deploy, and off it goes, and it puts everything into the cloud for you automatically. And this means that you now have a configuration file that you can share with your team. So instead of this random collection of stuff you've got in an AWS account that you might struggle to extract and share with somebody, you've got a project that you can give to somebody and say, go ahead and play with this uh, and make changes and then deploy it into the same AWS account I'm using so we can share these changes. Or into your own so you can test your own changes. It's, it's quite a, ma makes things quite flexible in that way. Um, and recently, we've also released the ability for, uh, uh, to add testing, monitoring, and security as part of the whole application development lifecycle. Uh, you might be asking, if you're an open source project, how do you make money? Well, we offer uh, a SaaS service that builds in monitoring into the serverless framework. So one of the difficulties traditionally with serverless development has been I've got all this awesome Lambda stuff in the cloud, but I've got no idea what it's doing. I don't even, I don't even know if there's errors happening. Well, we've tried to help solve that problem with monitoring tools that help you get to information about errors and so on. I can see by my time, I won't have time to show you that. So, okay. So, I'm going to do a very, 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 very quick demo. Can you all see this? Okay, I'm going to probably have to up the size of this a bit. Okay. So, this is a serverless service. Uh, I've got to find, there, I had it. All right. So I'm going to, uh, this is a very basic CRUD API. Uh, 
I'm keeping it simple because I don't have much time. But this is a serverless.yaml file. This is the core uh, configuration that you have for a serverless service. If you're not a fan of YAML, don't worry, you can do this in JSON or even as a JavaScript object. So, flexibility, yay. Uh, the idea here is that you want to configure a specific service, and you can see very quickly we have these, these settings here, I just want to mention them. This ties my service into my serverless account for my monitoring, this app and org. So I'm just going to ignore that for now, won't have time to show you. Um, but I've created a service called Kittens Crud, because my entity is, is kittens, kittens are cute, apparently. Uh, and I've chosen a runtime of Node.js Node 10. I could use any of the runtime supported by the cloud vendor that I'm deploying to. In this case, it's going to be AWS, but GCP is supported, Azure is supported, uh, and a bunch of others. I don't even remember them all. So my configuration here, I'm going to skip a bit of this. Um, what I'm jumping to is a se section about functions. So in this uh, part of my configuration here, you can see I'm specifying code that I want to execute. And my code sits in this file called handler, this handler.js over here. And the function name is create. And this is the C of CRUD. I've now got a list function here that'll list the entities. I've got a get function that's going get to get a specific entity. And I've got an update function to update one and a delete function to delete them. And what this looks like, I've got this all in a single file. But because you can do handler.function name, you could do a different file. You could break them out into multiple separate files. You've got, com got complete flexibility about how you write your code. In this case, I've got a create function. I've got a list function and so on. I'm not, the, the code is not what's important here. It's kind of how this is all put together. Because if you choose a different runtime, it's going to look completely different. But the basic idea here is each of these talk to DynamoDB, and I am also calling each of these via HTTP requests. So with this small bit of configuration here, let's start with the create. I've got a specific endpoint with a path of v1kitten that accepts post requests for me to add a kitten to my database. I can also then uh, slash v1 kitten as a get request to get all my kittens. I can slash v1 kitten with the kitten name to get a specific one. I can v1 kitten name as a put request to update and delete as well. And I also have a small configuration here to set up my database. So this is the database that it's going to uh, set up in AWS for me to allow me to store this data. This entire service I could take right now and run and deploy it into your AWS account and it will work straight out of the box because I can drop to a command line and you can see I've done this before. I can do a uh, SLS, which is short for serverless, deploy, and it's now going to go through the deployment process. Take my configuration file I built, take the code that I put into that handler.js file, and combine that into a way that AWS can understand it. It's going to create a cloud formation template. It's going to minify more my code. It's going to upload it into S3 and do all of these things that it needs to. I've even got, if you look up here, I've even got some permissions set up for IAM, if you're familiar, familiar with IAM. My Lambda functions cannot access any resource outside of themselves unless I explicitly give it to them in, a, in an IAM role statement in this way. So I've got complete control over the security of my functions. And this, uh, the deployment into AWS can take a little bit of time, but what you end up with is uh, endpoints in the end. So for the sake of time, I'm going to just close this. And right now I want to add, let me just make sure, So I've got my uh, get my list request. So I'm just going to retrieve the list of kittens from my database, and it should be empty. And you can see I've got, and I don't know if you guys can see that, but this is an empty array, just for those who can't see. So my list request brought back an empty array, which means I've got no data. And I want to add a kitten to my database. I run my API request. I get a 201. I pull the list again. I should now have Fluffykins, which is H12, out of my database. I can now make a specific request for Fluffykins, and I'll get that back as a single entity which is what, what you see there if you can't see it. I want to update Fluffykins and make it uh, 14 years old instead of 12, so I, pu uh, I push an update request. Uh, the update succeeded, let me do another list, and there we go, Fluffykins is now 14 years old, and my delete request will remove that uh, kitten from the database, and my list will now come back empty again. And that doesn't necessarily seem remarkable. Yip, yippee doo, we've built CRUD APIs before. But what's happening in the background is I've got an API gateway set up that is completely load balanced, oh, and a delete failed. Oh, that's because I deployed it wrong. So I have a stage, if I could spell development right. So the idea here is I have a separate stage that I can have for my, uh, my application. This one is called development. I could have a production one. I could have a testing one. I could have a QA one. They're all individual environments, completely separated logically. There's no sharing between them. Uh, but in this way, I can deploy multiple stacks of the same code for different purposes. So 
what I'm trying to get at is I have a fully production ready API sitting here ready to be used. Uh, if anybody here is able to uh, grab those URLs before I delete the service, uh, you'll be able to pull these uh, APIs as well. And they'll probably handle a lot of the load. Um, I haven't asked for any increased uh, uh, things from AWS. Uh, but this is the 10,000 requests per second from API Gateway. I get the 1,000 concurrent lambdas, all with running a deploy command, a configuration file, and a .js file. And I've got a fully production ready API ready to go and, and be used. So, yeah. Last one. Just to sum it up, I'm going to go through quickly. We've gone through the ability, to, we, we, we've gone through the history of managing everything ourselves to managing only software when we come to VMs, back to managing all this infrastructure and the connections now with, with all the container stuff that we want to do, but eventually getting to the serverless world where we're using managed services to replace a lot of this infrastructure to make it easier to manage our applications. And that's where I will leave for questions, if I have any time for that. So. Should we just take one question? And Sorry. if anyone does have questions, feel free, I'll be available. Ple please do. Sorry, I did see multiple hands. There's a okay. lot of complexity Great. that I've skipped over because it can be a much longer topic to talk about, so. Hi. Um, obviously, it, it seems very simple, um, but it also seems that it's, it's for simple use cases. So I'm trying to break down my monolith, and um, I've got a Java stack mm -hmm. with Spring and Hibernate. So um, moving that to serverless, should I be worried about uh, startup times because Spring, Hibernate, it takes a little bit of time to start up? And how difficult is it to break down that complicated monolith into these simple kind of use cases? Okay, so uh, I'm gonna answer the, the first of those three questions. Um, so th the one downside of uh, Lambda right now is what you call cold start times. Uh, this is actually not as big a deal as, as a lot of people seem to make it to be, to be really honest. There was a release two days I ago. I know. I'm going to mention, don't worry. I work for AWS, just so, in case you're wondering. And I, let me talk about that then. Thanks for grabbing the limelight. Um, AWS released an update not so long ago, because VPC, if you, if you rely on VPCs in AWS, VPCs and Lambda traditionally have been a bit of a nightmare to work with. You're looking at cold start times for Lambdas of being in the second region of seconds, which is not great if you're making a request to a Lambda function and it comes back five seconds later with a response. But two days ago, there was a release that, that, that's now being rolled out to all the regions, which eliminates that problem almost entirely. Uh, so that's a great, great thing. It's, if you need to work in VPCs with lambdas, you can pretty much do this now without that worry about that cold start time anymore uh, because of the way they've architected it. Um, it's a bit complex to go into the detail of it now, but it, it helps with that. The only other downside I can mention, if you're looking in the Java world and that's where you want to stay, is that unfortunately, because of a Java virtual machine, that sort of cold start time, uh, that is, does affect cold start times with lambdas to a degree. Uh, but... Uh, I, I would suggest taking a look at how those cold start times affect you because you might be surprised at how little they do. Uh, I've had these uh, concerns before even using something like Node which has much lower cold start times and you ultimately, uh, when things start getting busy in your environment, you start seeing less and less of an issue with cold start. And that's mostly because you have Lambda starting up concurrently in parallel and they stay warm as they call them. So you might initially, when that first burst of traffic comes through early in the morning, because the marketing team has sent an email the night before, you might see a couple of people are going to hit a bit of a bottleneck on those cold start times, but because they've now warmed up 20 uh, lambdas in parallel, those cold start times become less and less of an issue as traffic climbs. Uh, so it, it, you totally need to just see what that looks like in your environment. Uh, as for breaking down the monolith, that is a talk on its own, and I've done that talk. And um, the idea there, the, the very rough idea there is to take one piece at a time. Uh, try to find that one part of your application that doesn't quite need to fit in with everything else, doesn't necessarily need to be that <laughs> synchronous portion of everything else. The, the, the base example I give you is your transactional messaging system, like somebody uh, 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 registers with your service and you send them an email that says welcome. Take that and make that a microservice because that doesn't need to be tied so tightly to your existing monolith. You can make that an API call after registration is complete. It can take a few seconds. It kind of doesn't matter. If it falls over, somebody doesn't get a welcome email. Not the end of the world, but you're learning and you can improve. So that, that gives you a great way to sort of POC into that environment. And that's the kind of stuff you look at starting with. Because that gets you going with, this is how it works, this is how we're going to do it. We can build up for about reliability. And then you start taking those really important core pieces that you've now learned all these lessons from and go from there. And it's really uh, biting the elephant one, one bite at a time. 